Welcome to the Some Dare Call It Conspiracy Podcast, hosted by Brent Lee and Neil Sanders. After nearly 20 years exploring the world of conspiracy culture, we are taking our guests and listeners on a guided tour of the rabbit hole. Our mission, to discover where the truth lies. Hello, Flint. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Yourself, Brent? Yeah, wonderful. Like, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, been looking forward to this conversation ever since I put out that tweet on Twitter saying I should really be challenging myself on this belief that I held. So yeah, tell us who you are. Yeah, of course. So hi, I'm, I'm Flint Dibble, and uh, I'm an archaeologist at Cardiff University. I uh, focus specifically on Greek archaeology and environmental archaeology, but I have experience with excavations from sort of Neanderthal stone caves in France all the way to, you know, uh, Neolithic sites, Greek sites, Roman sites, medieval sites, etc. Um, and I'm, 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 I believe that we need to share real archaeology with real people. So I write Twitter threads, follow me at Flint Dibble on Twitter. And uh, I do my best to share real archaeology, you know, what, what we do today in the 21st century um, with people, because I find that sort of what's on TV doesn't always capture that. It's a little better in the UK. I'm from the US where what's on TV is a little worse. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think it's oftentimes sensationalized. And what we do is actually pretty awesome anyway. I don't think it needs the kind of shtick that it always gets of the oldest this or a mystery or whatever. There's all kinds of cool shit we do. So, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. True. Okay. Um, I'll just introduce myself as well because we might have some new listeners um, that might not know my story. From 2003 to 2018, I was a conspiracist. I was very much involved in a lot of the fringe theories. Like, not only did I believe in like an Illuminati or a New World Order style conspiracy that ran the world, but I also believed a lot of or entertained a lot of the fringe theories to do with, say, UFOs or cryptozoology ancient civilizations, ancient aliens, all, all of that type of thing. I've 15 years is a long time down the rabbit hole and you go through a lot of things. Uh, in 2018, I gave it up and started looking into why I believed what I believed. The one thing I kind of haven't moved away from is this Graham Hancock ancient civilization sort of stuff, which listening to some of his stuff now, I can really recognize some conspiracist talking points and i've learned a lot from immunologists and scientists since the pandemic so i feel like it's very very important to actually speak to the actual experts to hear what they've got to say so that's why i wanted to have this conversation with you today really to to hear the other side so first i just want to ask like when did you come across Graham Hancock? Is he like infamous in your field? And <laughs> I mean, so pseudo archaeology itself, you know, what we consider fake archaeology in a sense, this rhetoric that people, Hancock included, use that sort of suggests even though they are not professionals in the field, they know better than us, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, obviously pseudo archaeology is a problem everywhere. Um, they, they try to use kind of stigmatized language, like we're trying to hide the past and, uh, we're trying to hide knowledge from the public. And so that's obviously something that, that troubles all archeologists because we're, we're very open to share, um, what we know about the past with people. We want to share it. That's why we're in this field. That's why we teach what we do. And we, we, we agree to talk with people on podcasts and things like <laughs> that. And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I've heard of Graham Hancock for a long time. But to be honest, look, I, I, to most archaeologists, pseudo-archaeology is kind of fun. It's funny. It's sort of like how do, how do people actually believe in something like aliens building the pyramids or a, an Ice Age civilization that we have no evidence for despite having thousands of Ice Age sites that we've excavated, right, right. around the world. And so it's just kind of sort of silly to a lot of us in the field. And I think it's, there's, been a, there's been a vocal minority of archaeologists that have been talking about this for the last several decades and how we need to rigorously understand why there's so many people that believe these things that 
that really are completely lacking in evidence. But I, I think there's been a growing trend that archaeologists need to recognize this as something serious that we need to address and that we are we're sort of failing to address the public. Um, because there's been several surveys over the last 10 years that show an increase in people that believe in these kind of things, like yeah, aliens or an Ice Age civilization or whatnot. And so for me, it was all something I laughed at until a few years ago, right? I'd heard of Graham Hancock, but it, that, that was about it. I, I knew that he was this guy with this idea, um, but I became kind of <laughs> almost dragged into a controversy over a different TV show about a year ago called Hunting Atlantis. And uh, that was the, my what started me thinking more rigorously and in depth about um, these kind of conspiracy theories that these pseudo-archaeologists propose. Um, and so I quickly realized that, that, yeah, Atlantis is something that I can speak to, um, in a lot of depth because I study Greek archaeology. I study the period that Plato wrote down this idea in. And at the same time, I have the, the modern conception of Atlantis in the last 200 years since Ignatius Donnelly wrote his bestseller, sort of Atlantis, the Antediluvian uh, Civilization. Uh, that's, that, that, by the way, is a direct correlate of what Graham Hancock's model, right? It's from this book written in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, which proposes this advanced pre-flood civilization that's responsible for technology and agriculture, gunpowder even, all over the world, um, sort of at, the, at when this flood sort of destroyed these, these early society, this early society, in quotes, scare quotes. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing more and more research into this over the last sort of two years, let's say, around there. And I'm working, I'm, 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 I'm thinking I want to write a book on Atlantis because there isn't anything that's popular that's out there that sort of presents this large picture from an expert to the public, sort of explaining why these these ideas that are gaining traction again today, why they, they really don't stand on any ground. We can easily disprove the idea of this Ice Age civilization or Atlantis in general, um, it's fairly easily disprovable with the amount of evidence we have today. And so that's kind of my background. And uh, I think especially I became even more embroiled in this because of the ancient apocalypse blow up. I wrote a, a, a Netflix advertised the show to me um, the first day it came out. It was a Friday night. I was sitting there with my wife and said, let's, let's check this out. And four hours later, I was very annoyed, let's say, after a <laughs> bottle of wine, and I didn't expect to watch all four hours of it in one sitting. And I did. And I just sort of, you know, over the past year, I'd read several of Hancock's books. I'd, uh, most of them, in fact, and uh, I'd, I'd read Ignatius Donnelly. I'd read a bunch of other pseudo-archaeology things and a bunch of other Atlantis things. And, uh, and so I, I very quickly, over that first weekend, penned a Twitter thread, which has now been seen by millions. And then that led to an op-ed in the conversation, which was seen by 200,000 people. And that led to you inviting me on here and so on and so forth. So yeah, I'm, I'm ready to get into the weeds of it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. and, and, and I'm interested also, sorry, I've been talking for a while, <laughs> but uh, I'm interested also to think more about how this overlaps with sort of modern conspiracism. I think that that's something that is important. I, I understand that it does. There's archaeologists that do research on this, and my bits of research show this. But talking with you, I'm hoping to get a better, a better understanding of that for my own sort of headspace. If you see what I mean. Yeah, that, that's what yeah. I'm trying to do. Just trying to explain, I guess, why I believed what I believed. It might help people understand what, you know, why people believe what they believe. You touched quickly on the um, antediluvian civilization. All right. So yeah. the crux of Hancock's theory is that there was an advanced civilization before the ice age. And you've just stated there's no evidence for it, right? Is there any evidence of any civilization before the ice age? Well, so here's where we get to definitions, right? So how do you define civilization? How do you define advanced? These are sort of tricky questions and they really are. In fact, I'm not a big fan of either of those terms. Those are sort of really early archaeology and history terms. If you think about it, civilization is oftentimes used to sort of otherize uncivilized people. So you're either civilized or you're not. And so there's this pejorative connotation. I tend to think that people, as soon as there's people around, they're pretty dang complex. We have evidence of complex behavior, sort of iconography, sort of advanced, let's say, new ways to, to collect food, 
um, sort of a broader spectrum diet, people moving around from very early on in human evolution, right? And so uh, what does this mean in a sense? What's advanced technology and what's a civilization, if you will? Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, we certainly have Ice Age evidence of kind of people coming together in large groups. So there, uh, it, the, you can see this kind of right near the end of the Ice Age in places, but even in kind of the area of, of, of modern Russia, we have people that built large sort of structures out of mammoth bones and tusks, right? And so right. we have that from deep in the Ice Age. And so we're talking well before what Graham Hancock would consider even his advanced civilization. And so we, we certainly have evidence of materials being transported long distance, useful materials like my namesake, Flint, and, and sort of stone and stuff like that being transported long distance. Now, when Hancock talks about this idea of an advanced civilization, one of the descriptors he uses for it, he uses two key things that, that we can easily sort of debunk, um, if you will, if you want to use the term debunk, but we can prove not true, which is the uh, global. Global is something we definitely have no evidence for. We are at a, a, a state in archaeology today where we can sort of do analyses, laboratory analyses on organic materials, so human remains, animal remains, plant remains, etc., as well as on inorganic materials, stones, uh, different kinds of inorganic stuff, minerals and whatnot. And we can therefore see from these analyses, whether it's isotopes or whether it's mineral tracing or, or whatnot, the origin of the materials and how far they've moved. The origin, we can see mobility of people, sort of, uh, we find a human that was buried or deposited in a cave or in a grave or in some sort of context. We can do this kind of isotope analysis on their teeth which were growing when they were young, and we can see where they, the, the regions that they grew up in compared to the region where they died and were buried or deposited in, right? Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't have evidence of sort of the global movement of people and goods, animals, plants, etc. That is, without a doubt, not happening. Another marker of this kind of advanced civilization proposed by Hancock, and by the way, all these ideas go back to Donnelly and even before the 19th century. They were all proposed hundreds of years ago, right? 150 years ago, at least. And so uh, is agriculture. And yes, that, yes. that's, again, something that we can easily disprove because we have a really good sense of how agriculture develops, right? And so we, we have that from sort of the morphology of seeds and of animal remains. So the domestication of plants and animals, we can trace it in sort of the way that these, the, the morphology, the structure of these sort of organisms changes with domestication. We also now, uh, over the last 20 years especially, we have a growing body of genetic evidence. And that confirms the timelines that we have from our morphological evidence um, as an independent confirmation, right? And so we can tell that, that, that these different plants and animals were domesticated in different regions at times that are definitely dating after the Ice Age. If there was a global agricultural civilization, right? Mm -hmm. And its survivors established agriculture all over the world. We would also expect to see the same kinds of plants and animals all over the world, right? We have a modern global civilization today where we transport our organisms and we've seen them go all over the world. Instead, we see different organisms domesticated in different regions at different times with sort of this local progression. And so that's very much a nail in the coffin of this. And then the third one is this monumental architecture. That's the other sort of key that these, these alternative pseudo-archaeologists use to identify kind of a, 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 this kind of advanced civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like pyramids. <laughs> and and well, it's, it's not always pyramids. It could be just large stone structures. Yeah. And in all these kind of cases, we can see the local development again of these kind of technologies and of the abilities to build these kind of monumental stone structures, right? It isn't something that just appears out of nowhere with aliens or migrants from a civilization that, that disappeared. It's, it, it shows local development one stage after another until you get these magnificent structures. But what you see on TV or in the books is they go to the, the biggest, bestest pyramid, like the Great Pyramid of Giza, and they say, this just appeared out of nowhere. And it's like, no, we have generations of evidence going back that shows the development of these structures, right? They didn't even start yeah. off as pyramids. And we have depictions of the pyramid builders showing us how they transported large stones. We have 
writings and evidence from the people who built them themselves. We've excavated these, you know, the village of the pyramid builders near Giza. And so all these things we can show are very much local sort of developments, um, which, which, yeah, would be a sort of nail in the coffin on this kind of argument, if that makes sense. Um, we can delve yeah. into some more details if you have more questions or thoughts. My own reading of like this kind of material is that it wasn't necessarily that these um, structures or monuments were built back in those like 10,000 years ago. It's that they're astronomically aligned and pointing to a date around 10,500 BC. Yeah. Not necessarily that they were built at that time, but that's what they're pointing towards. And to be honest, that's like one of the main thing that really does still resonate with me or I don't have an answer for. You know, it okay. does seem very strange. I've been re-listening to Ancient Apocalypse and like Graham states that the astronomical stuff is completely irrelevant to yourselves. Like you, you don't think it's relevant at all. Like, is that true or... <laughs> that, that, I, I think it's best to clarify what we mean by astronomical alignments, right? Okay. So, uh, and I think that what we, what, what I want to make sure we understand is context, because that's the key of interpreting a kind of archaeological pattern, right? Yeah. And so, uh, when we talk about do archaeologists pay attention to astronomical alignments? Yeah, of course. If we can find alignments that match in local cultural areas and we can find a pattern where most structures are aligning in one way or another whether it's with the sun so like solstices and stuff like that or with star alignments there's all kinds of peer-reviewed archaeological literature about that that's that's without a doubt really uh, oh yeah yeah there's tons of this um, from from North, from the Americas to Europe to Africa and whatnot, um, the Asia and beyond, and so you know there, there's there's people looking at that those kind of questions, and so to argue that archaeologists do not pay attention to that is is bogus. Now, the problem with the arguments by Hancock and and other pseudo archaeologists is one they play a little fast and loose with how they define astronomical alignments. If you go and watch Ancient Apocalypse, right? Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about astronomical alignments, a good one that I that I did this for myself and I encourage people to do this, is in the episode that's with North America where they're talking about Poverty Point and he's mm -hmm. talking about Serpent Mound. Serpent Mound, yes. Yeah. They they show these monuments and they draw a line on the screen of the astronomical alignment for the argument they're trying to make. Pause it at that moment. Look really closely at that image because it just it's just there for a, a quick second or two on the on the TV program. Unless you intentionally pause it, you're not going to see that actually this astronomical argument they're making it isn't spot on. Mm -hmm. it, it, it the 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 alignment between Poverty Point and the other mound. Poverty Point's this huge mound. They use the anchor as like I forget if it's far on the west or far on the east side. Right. And so it's not exactly with the, with the serpent. They're choosing arbitrarily the neck of the serpent with the center of the spiral. Obviously, between any two points, you're going to find connections right within a complicated uh a complicated form like that serpent you could choose the jaw you could choose the tooth you could choose the tip of the tail you could choose the center of the spiral you could choose the hinge where the jaw meets you have so <laughs> many different choices you're <laughs> always going to find something that matches in that and that's the problem we have so many and that's where i want to go back to that point about context you find one pyramid that matches true north and it's like what does this even mean you need to find a whole lot of pyramids in the same culture that match true north to make an argument, not just one pyramid, because, of course, when you have a hundreds of pyramids, one of them is going to line up with true north if they match a bunch of different orientations. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're willing to accept some level of error. <laughs> that that's going to make it, which they are, right? Um, Hugh Graucott has a number of uh, Twitter threads under the hashtag, what is it, uh, Serious Fallen. And he looks at the alignment of those temples, the complexes on Malta, that was also a key argument in Ancient Apocalypse. And again, he goes through the point that when you look at them all, there's so much variability that this pattern that they're talking about is not really justified. If you squint and you sort of say, all right, we're going to accept this level of error and we're going to accept all these other issues with it, 
fine, but those are still real legit issues, right? Hmm. And so that's why I mentioned the, the context. You really need to look at the context of these kind of arguments. But archaeologists look at astronomical alignments. And then the other key thing is the dating. This is where I think you misheard Hancock. Uh, he argues that that the reason all these monuments uh, line up with some precession that dates to 10,000 years ago is because that's better proof of when they're built, right? And so th that's actually what he argues with Malta and stuff like that. And uh, that's a big problem because we have convincing evidence that those monuments could not have been built at that time because we have cultural layers underneath the monuments that predate the dating of the monuments. We know because the monuments were built on those sealed layers. And we know that those 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 date later than, than 10,000 BC. I um, noticed that myself in the first episode. I'm sorry, I forgot where it was, but it's um it's a bunch of stones all laying down on top of a mound. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, Gunan Padang. Yeah, that's yeah. that's it. Yeah, and yeah. he dig they dig down to, to the cultural layer, and it's <laughs> and and then they dig down to a second cultural layer, which is like thousands of years old. And I'm thinking to myself, but hold on, the the temples like at the top, what's the cultural layer at the bottom got to do with the yeah, thing exactly. at the top that doesn't actually make sense? And it just clicked just then. I was like, that that doesn't make sense, Graham. I don't I don't understand. You're exactly um, right with that argument because it's even worse for Gunung Padang because they don't even dig it. It's with a core. They just drill a very narrow core down right. and then they date the sediments. They don't even know if those are human sediments that have evidence of humans. They're just dating the time when those sediments were deposited and they're going down like 50 meters. Why is a deposit 50 meters down have anything to do with standing architecture at the top? Like, yeah. come on. Like... <laughs> I felt I felt really stupid after I heard that. I was like, hold, hold on, well, how that's been right in my face the whole time. How did I not even think of that? Back to the serpent mound, mm -hmm. and an argument put forward by Graham and, and others is that yeah, the mouth doesn't align today. It's a one or two degrees off, but if you move the time back, it points to ten thousand five hundred BC. And the same with the Giza complex with the Sphinx pointing at Leo, if we go back 10,000 to 10,500 BC. Now, I got into Graham from Fingerprints of the Gods, and that was just like a, such a fascinating book to me the first time I read it. I, it was just amazing. And then putting all that together, I just thought, wow, this, how, how did this happen? How did they know this? This is amazing. And the Fingerprints of the Gods section, I know like the Sphinx pointing towards Leo does point towards the 10,500 BC, but then Robert Schock comes along with his the ripples d down the side of the Sphinx and then saying that it had to be watered there at 10,500 BC. So that's when it was built. But again, like I never really thought that that means these things were built at 10,500 BC. And that's the thing with conspiracists. Like we take a bit of information and we filter out the stuff that isn't going to make sense to us and we try and move our little goalposts and do that because like i wasn't necessarily searching for an ancient civilization i was looking for our ancient rulers like i i did believe sort of the ancient alien theory but i thought they were fallen angels and it comes to the you know genesis 6 the sons of god came to the daughters of man and they bore children to them and that's kind of where this whole mythology sort of picks up that's what i was always thinking well maybe they're pointing at 10,500 bc that's when the fallen angels came or the ancient alien theories they're saying the same thing that's when that came but Graham's older work, definitely, he was pointing towards there was a cataclysm mm -hmm. at that point. Was there? Was there any cataclysm? <laughs> well, first off, at I just want to go time. back. To, yeah, I just want to go back to something you mentioned, which is, and I want to really highlight the importance of local context, right? Because when you start putting together things from all over the world, what you're doing is you're stripping the context that we actually have. Archaeology is definitely a rigorous study of the past, and mm -hmm. we have thousands of sites in any region that you could think of around the world. And so if you start comparing, you know, stuff from Serpent Mound to Egypt to, to Indonesia, you're, you're missing out on the picture that's local to any area, right? And so I, that we're going to 
keep this in mind because now we're going to talk about this kind of cataclysm. And so a lot of the mythology behind this cataclysm comes from sort of flood stories, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that's sort of the, the hook again. And again, it's using that same exact method of building this kind of larger context than actually exists for those stories. Those stories, of course, are told in very local cultures at specific times, passed on sometimes orally, written down at times, and then eventually they get to us through these various mechanisms when we can study them either as ethnographers, historians, archaeologists, etc., right? But they come from these very local sort of so social and cultural contexts. And if you're going to start comparing all of them on a global level, you're just ignoring those local contexts, right? And that's important because if you think about it, flood stories, okay, we have a lot of flood stories. Seems like that's kind of an interesting pattern. All but around if, the world, all around civilizations the world. that have never seen each other. Yeah, but right. okay, Brent, so – You've been alive for at least a couple decades, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so over your several decades of living, you've been watching the news at times. Have you seen any major floods around the world? Uh, I've seen some floods, nothing yeah. like global. Yeah, nothing global, but you've certainly seen some floods that impact yeah. millions tsunamis of people. Tsunamis and yeah. tsunamis, rainstorms that flood cities in the wrong place, uh, hurricanes, etc. All over the world, we have seen floods just within our lifetimes, severe floods that wreak havoc. True. And you wonder why there's stories of floods all over the world, because with, within the period of a decade, there's a flood somewhere, a major flood on this world. And so for that to turn into a story, that's not too surprising, or just the concept of floods as a story, because floods are not such an uncommon thing. People that live along rivers, you know, the, the Rome, ancient Rome, is along a bend in the Tiber River. And because it's where the river curves, that's exactly the place that's prone to flooding. You go to Rome today, there's all this modern geoengineering with super deep, with major concrete embankments. It's not going to flood today. But in ancient times, it flooded quite regularly. And in fact, we have flood markers from, you know, especially from sort of the Renaissance and before the medieval period. These flood markers, we know how high these floods got. And we can look at descriptions and historical texts. We can look at the way they even built their sewer system. The sewer system in ancient Rome goes two ways. The reason why is you can't stop the flood. So it's better to let the flood come up through the sewers so that it can quickly drain again later once the river abates. That's the easiest and quickest way. There's a whole book on the floods of the Tiber by Greg Aldrich. It's just ph phenomenal. And it shows just how regular floods are, whether it's from the sea, an earthquake with a tsunami, a hurricane, uh, the, the monsoon, or a river flood on an annual, on an annual basis that occasionally gets out of control. Um, the floods are just a regular phenomenon for humans. And that, so that's... That would make sense with like... Um with the Nile mm -hmm. and then Egypt having Egyptians having flood stories, but also with Mesopotamians because they're between the Tigris and Euphrates. Like yeah. they had uh, flood stories as well. So yeah, I, I, I see that now. And I mean, humans have to live where there's fresh water, right? We have to live mm. where there's fresh water or we're not going to live. And so that's why, and even very dry areas when it, it, on the occasion, I've, I've lived in Greece for several years, and so I lived in Greece just uh, – well, I wasn't there living, but I was there last uh, – in October of 2021, right? And there was just this nasty rainstorm that hit Athens. And in dry areas when, when – when just what we would consider you know, a rainstorm for here for the UK, when that hits something like Athens, it floods, and it floods badly. My friend's apartment got completely flooded. I had to go over there and clean it all up in the middle of this rainstorm. And so it's just because those areas, even what we would consider a strong rainstorm, but regular in wet areas of the world, in dry areas, they're very severe. They cause sort of landslides. They cause complete reshaping of hills even. Um, just what we would consider a severe thunderstorm. Nothing to really be scared about or write home about. In dry areas, this can be something severe because it's so unusual. And the landscape and the construction as well that humans do is not set up for it, right? And so, yeah, this kind of stuff. And that's why we need to understand these local contexts. Now, let's go back 10,000 years ago. And there is something we do know that was happening. And that is that the Ice Age was ending 
right? Right. And so in this sense, we certainly know that the sea level was also rising, something we're seeing today in our world, right? Mm, yeah. And so, uh, so we certainly know that areas that were land eventually – are submerged under the sea, like off the coast of Britain, Doggerland, this whole giant plateau of a shelf, that would have been, you know, land that people in the Stone Age were living on. And so, but this did not become submerged in an event. It was a process that took thousands of years, right? right. And so this is something that happens over thousands of years Obviously, during those thousands of years, there will be certain periods of flooding, without a doubt, events for major rainstorms or, you know, when, when it's risen above a certain level, well, then all of a sudden a valley might become inundated for, you know, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But, yeah. but at the same time, this is a long-term process, not a short-term process. It's a series of events and a series of, of natural processes with the sea level rising. And so that's important to consider as well. So obviously we have evidence for submersion of areas where people were living. And this then ties back into sort of what people like Hancock claim. They claim, well, why is there no evidence for what I'm arguing? It's because it's under water, right? right. And well, there's two reasons why that's not, a, well, there's three really. One is, geez, you're really making an argument based off of nothing. You know, this is this ends up becoming circular if you see what I mean. Yeah. We there's a there's an ice age civilization. It's been destroyed. Why don't we have evidence for it? Because it's been destroyed. Why does it exist? Because we don't have evidence for it that's destroyed. Right. It's a big circular argument. <laughs> okay. That that's a nice sort of encapsulation of it. But we also have more evidence than just that. There's a lot of underwater archaeology that occurs. We have lots of underwater archaeological surveys. We found plentiful evidence of Stone Age sites underwater, and none of them have the kind of technology, agriculture, megalithic constructions, etc., that are argued for here, right? We, 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 we've studied. It's not that we have the perfect picture of Doggerland or of sort of, I, I know better, the Aegean in, in the Greek world. Um, we, we, but we, we, we've studied this stuff. We, we have evidence for it. It's not perfect, but, we, but it, it's, it, it's evidence. And so we know what these, that these people were Stone Age hunter-gatherers and at times early farmers uh, later on um, in these areas that become submerged over thousands of years. Um, and then the third, wait, I thought I had a third one. <laughs> um, we, we have evidence. No, it's blanking on me. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. But no, we do have this kind of evidence. We understand it, right? It's not something that is like a blank slate for archeology. span It is something we understand. And so, so yeah. And it was something that was slow. And it's something we should also, I, I, I would think, pay attention to um, mm. with the fact that sea level is rising right now, right? And so we'll definitely see more of that continue in our lifetimes as well. So if there was a structure um, pointed out, say, by Graham, and it looked like something worthy of like investigation, then someone would look for it, look into it, yeah? Like... I don't know, not ex not this example, but Bimini Road or something like that. If if there was something, would someone actually go and look into it? Yeah, or just so dismiss it because it's Graham. No, no, everybody's looked. I mean, we've we've looked into all these things. Bimini Road has multiple publications by geologists and archaeologists demonstrating that it's a natural feature. Right. This is not something that people have not looked into. All the sites that Graham has gone to in his show and in his books, they've been investigated by archaeologists. In fact, you know, it's so funny. The opening of Ancient Apocalypse, they go to Gunung Padang and they're like, you know, archaeologists, they didn't know there was this site in the middle of the jungle. How could they miss this? And they show these shots of all this architecture that's monumental in cleared field. It's been cleared and studied by archaeologists. That's the reason it's there for that kind of <laughs> shot, right? Every single site he goes to has been cleared, excavated, conserved, preserved, curated, and presented by archaeologists, right? And so for him to say that we're not investigating this stuff, we're investigating these sites. And many people, because of the fact that some of these arguments have become very popularized, we also have people that go and investigate the specific arguments made by these alternative historians and pseudo-archaeologists, mm -hmm. just like me working on a book about Atlantis right now, right? And so this is just, this is just part of their rhetoric, 
if you see what I mean, saying yeah. that we don't do this stuff. No, every single place he goes in every documentary and book he's done has had scientific excavation, right? And scientists looking at it and scholars looking at it and publishing on it. We have books, articles, uh, pamphlets and signs, you know, at all these sort of sites. And so, yeah, there's been a lot of work done and a lot of thought on it. Do you mind if I back up one second? I remember what yeah, the third sure. argument was. Uh, we were talking about why there's no evidence. And this also, I guess, relates here is, is, well, you know, when you think about what's submerged, that's just a small portion of, of where people were living. Obviously, people were living in what was then the uplands. No human society only lives in lowlands. So we have all these sites that were not submerged. And again, we were looking underwater. We're looking in caves, we're looking in jungles, we're looking in deserts, we're looking at sites that are preserved and presented, and we're, we're doing our best to understand the past and share it and, and teach people. So, yeah, this is just part of their rhetoric. <laughs> it's, it's very familiar rhetoric. Yeah. It's like putting, putting doubts on you know, and, the experts or the authorities. And uh, there was something he said in it also that I was just like, what do you – that Graham, that's not actually responsible. And he and he said, "Trust your instincts. You know, don't just listen to the experts." And I don't <laughs> really agree with that today. And you know what he's winking at is he's not even saying trust your instincts. He's saying trust me, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really sad because I I've spent like twenty years actually liking this person. You know, I've gone to see two of his two mm -hmm. of his talks. I've I've bought every book from Fingerprints of the Gods up into Supernatural. You know, I look at him like, oh, he's he's Uncle Graham <laughs> to me. He's like a nice guy, and it's just like it. It's kind of it's very sad, and it's it's a bit painful. Like thinking, hold hold on, this guy actually might be lying to me. I cannot speak to his motivations, but he definitely does a good job in how he presents himself as as someone who's just asking questions as someone who's been wronged mm. um but yes. of, of course when i see these things what i see is an attack on what i do he's he's riling people up against people like me i, I don't get paid very much for what i do i i we struggle to convince the governments to fund you know, university and research and to make sure that there's cultural heritage laws to protect cultural heritage from from um, amateur people that might be doing harm to it to just make a profit. Um, and so uh, th that's a problem. And, uh, and it's very scary to me, in a sense, to see this growing popularity. I mean, obviously, Graham has been very successful as a best selling author. Um, but at least from my perspective, this kind of stuff has not really succeeded on TV outside of the Americas, except with his recent show. And I think mm -hmm. that's why it sort of made all these headlines, right? Especially because all the headlines were mostly outside of the U.S., where this was not news. That was par for the course, because the History Channel has this stuff being popular <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Ancient and, aliens being one yeah, of them. Exactly. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a shame to see this popularity grow so much and uh i don't know i i guess my i have a if you don't mind me asking you a couple questions yeah I have go a couple for it. questions for you i guess the first one would be sort of how can people like me speak effectively to people that are either enamored in this way of believing and are you know, our huge fans that see him as Uncle Graham or something like that. Um, how do we speak to people like that or to people that are sort of on the fence? That's another, I, I try to mostly address people that are on the fence because I feel safer doing that. Um, it's also less time consuming because you don't get bombarded by trolls. Um, but uh, you can, you, or people that are acting in bad faith, I should say. Um, so how do you, how would you recommend experts speaking to, to, to this component of the public well i think in the whole field of science you just need better communicators the way that graham and other authors like this communicate to people is on a very very normal layman's like language and to be honest i think experts are a little bit boring sometimes they use too many like technical terms and, and there's a way i guess that they speak 
to the person, which is what I'm trying to do without like without specifically debunking actual data. I try and attack the talking points instead because mm -hmm. the talking points are the thing that grabs you first. You know, so if you can counter some of the talking points, like I think that would be, you know, it would be very beneficial. I think showing that you have looked at this stuff or that th these things, you know, are looked into, they're not ignored. That would definitely make people start to listen. I think, you know, people like, say John Hoops at the minute, like on Twitter, he, he's not doing a good job of talking to other people because he's just being very vitriolic about it. Um, like I respect the guy's expertise in that, but I just don't feel like it's very, it's very productive. I'm very, very interested in open debate. And I do think like John or yourself should debate Graham, you know, on uh, I don't know if Joe Rogan's really the best place, but somewhere I do feel like all of these ideas should be addressed and openly debated in the open so other people can see it. Because sh shutting it down or saying, well, I'm not going to platform a bad idea, it just, it does help the other side. I mean, look, I have responded to the idea of a debate with Graham Hancock on Joe Rogan, and I said I could do it. He yeah. suggested to John in the spring, I will be in the U.S. in the spring, and if the dates lined up, I would be willing to do it. I'm not sure if it's the best idea given the venue. Obviously, Joe Rogan is a giant fan of mm -hmm. Graham Hancock. He was a producer and on the show, but I think that I would have a strategy about how to deal with that. In fact, I have one. Um, so I've offered to do that. Um, the reply, that this was right after John Hoops rejected the idea. He has his reasons for wanting to reject it, and I, I respect Some, those. That's, yeah. that's, everybody needs to deal with things in different ways. Um, I do my best to speak clearly without jargon. I, I, I hope I've done minimal of that even in this interview here. Yeah, and, sim and same with all my Twitter threads on Twitter and in interviews I do, I try to focus on those kind of talking points. Like you say, I think that that's key. I, I, I don't want to get bogged down and taken off on a sidetrack. And that's why I think that I could talk with Graham in a setting like Joe Rogan or let's invite him on here. I don't know if this is exactly neutral ground, but on the other hand, no, it's the yeah, it would be. I, I've I've hosted um, a debate on Twitter between an anti-vaxer and an immunologist, and I will be completely neutral and just let the two experts talk. They're the two that need to have it, and all I do is watch the time and make sure the other person isn't really speaking over the other person because I think the two voices need to be heard. Both sides need to be heard. Both audiences need to hear the other side. I would do it in a heartbeat on a Twitter space, completely not for profit. It's all about the information. And if you're up for that, Graham, like hit me <laughs> up anytime. <laughs> I, so I'm up for that kind of venue. They Graham has turned around and changed the invite to the Cosmic Summit in June. And uh, that is a pseudo-archaeology conference that people have to pay if they want to even watch such a debate. Um, and it's only going to have their fans. And it's right in the middle of my excavation season. So yeah. there's zero I don't think it's a fair venue. I honestly I, I, don't think that would I, be a fair venue. Charging I, people for it would not be a good idea. Yeah, that's my issue. If it was on Joe Rogan, I don't think it would be a fair venue per se. But I think the 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 number of people that would tune in would at least mean that there's people there that are receptive to what I have to say, right? Because there's going to yeah. be a, such a huge audience that I'm going to be able to have the chance to connect with an audience that is potentially receptive. Um, yeah. But yeah, something like the Cosmic Summit, there's no way I, I would do that. I, for multiple reasons, I simply just can't as well. I'm literally in Greece at that time <laughs> on a project. So the, for all of June and July, and so there's no way over the summer that archaeologists can do much. Uh, for a debate, but I am willing to do something on here, on Rogan, on something where we just zoom in, as long as it's not over the summer where I don't always have good internet access and my time is tight. But, uh, but yeah, so, so I'm willing to, I think that, that, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that if approached well, it can be beneficial from a scientific point of view. 
um, for, for outreach, but it does need to be approached uh, in a sort of rigorous fashion. You can't just go in there and expect your expertise to, to win out. I think you need to have, yeah. I think you need to explain what we do, why we do it, how we do it and make sure it's compelling. Um, so yeah, I'm down. I, I'm just a postdoc. I don't have the ability to create a venue other than over zoom. <laughs> I could create it over Zoom and upload it on my YouTube channel, but other than that, I have no other abilities per se in that sense. So, yeah, I'm. I, I, I mean, you know, it's tough. I certainly respect the decision of the the what is it, the Ohio History Connection that that rejected uh, Graham from filming at the Serpent Mound. Um, there were multiple reasons for that. I, I think that people that are responsible for cultural heritage, they need to respect the groups that they are, you know, they're their own uh, communities, right? And yeah. so that includes indigenous communities today. The, I can speak to the Greek government. The Greek government, obviously, also, I don't know if they've rejected Graham, but at the same time, the, you need to put in a permit that shows that you're going to respect Greek cultural heritage with whatever you're doing to be able to film at a Greek site. Right. And so that that's logical. It makes sense. And so I think that it's unfair to say that in, in every circumstance where archaeologists deny filming, I think he also wanted to do it on the solstice, which would have been also religiously insulting to the indigenous communities. Right. right. Um, from what I understand. And so, and he didn't say that. He didn't no. explain that when he when he reads out the email. He just says, yeah. and they said a multitude of other reasons. Yeah, and he also Tell didn't us. explain that he's still allowed on site. They're just rejecting his permit to film, which is obviously also a, a, lots of archaeological sites are like that. You can't just get a permit to just film anywhere. You have to justify it. And so that's just normal for any documentary, to be honest. That's not, And that just has to do with a variety of things. It could just be logistics or it could be respect for, you know, the, the stakeholders involved in a site, right? right. Um, and so... So like you know, you want to go film at Stonehenge when the on the solstice when the when Druid communities are gathering. No, that's not going to fly, <laughs> right? And because you're going to be pissing off these communities that that have a sort of right to their ability to to gather in places and and do what they do. And so, yeah. So uh, I, I can't say that I I I I think there's certain instances where people or communities or institutions have reasons for not allowing filming or for not wanting to debate, but I certainly am open to the idea. Um, but I do think that the best thing we can do, as you said, is to, to speak to, to the public um, in a way that, 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 that demystifies what we do, that shows why it's interesting and that, that eliminates jargon to our, to, to, to make it. So it's, uh, you know, simple enough though. I do wonder sometimes if that's, what's effective because you sometimes listen to to Graham, um, and he he he'll have parts where he's I, I'd have to find it, but it's the the part about the procession where all of a sudden I remember seeing that, and I'm like, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about, man. Like you're you're, you're using very complex jargon to make your point, and I wonder sometimes if audiences they also want a little bit of jargon to to make it sound uh, legit. Yeah, legit, right? And so if you're just making it like I'm chatting over a beer, which I could do, I could get a beer with you and do that. Um, it's sort of like that's that's that might not be what appeals to everybody. I don't I don't really know. I think I, my argument in the lecture I gave recently on this topic to the University of Vienna was that look, we all have our different ways of speaking up. We all should be doing it um, yeah. to the best we can and 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 start to demystify this and. And archaeology. People are different, aren't they? Some, like you said, some people take information in differently. Yeah. Some people need more data. Some people just need the emotive mm -hmm. speech. And I think any of the all, all of the above is good. And I think also just kind of practicing helps my ability to communicate uh, in a more, let's say, without as much jargon. That comes from the fact that as a grad student, I went and talked with preschoolers and at retirement homes and you know, at kindergartners. I got used to doing that. And, uh, and I, I strongly believe in, in never dumbing down what I'm saying. It's just about making it clear, right? Yeah. Um, it's never and, – and that's something that I think I sometimes see with some of my colleagues. They, they, they make a simplified narrative as opposed to thinking through the language to use to make a, a nuanced narrative and an interesting nuanced narrative uh, understandable, right, and compelling. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, I have one more question for you. Go for um, 
So how much does this, in your estimation, having been in these conspiracist communities, and I'm assuming a variety, well, you mentioned in the intro, a variety of them, um, how much is there a clear overlap between sort of alternative history, pseudo-archaeology, and other types of conspiracy thinking, right? So mm -hmm. obviously conspiracy thinking comes in a wide range of flavors, and no two people believe the exact same things. Do you see sort of stuff like pseudo-archaeology and alternative history as a stepping stone towards other things or as part of a larger collection that a lot of people believe in? Or is it something that each of these different contexts of conspiracy thinking just exist separately of one another and the overlap is coincidental? I can see it as like an entry point to conspiracism because of the language you know, like you said earlier, like, oh, so all the archaeologists are lying to you. Here's what I found. They're not allowed to tell you, you know, that's just conspiratorial mindset straight off the bat. So it could, it can easily open you up to that. But if you're already into conspiracies, then that's already attractive as well. You, you start going into different rabbit holes, then you come across that and you, here's a good example, right? When I was a conspiracist, this is literally about 2015, 16, when I'm sort of on my way out, okay. the flat earth conspiracy theories start popping up. All right. And the very first instance, and I thought, well, that sounds like bollocks. Like, I, I know this is just garbage. And my friend sent me a message and like we were talking about it. And I just said, it's just stupid. I'm not even going to look at it. And he said, no, Brent, you're missing the point here. NASA, they're the ones lying to us about it. And because he said that, I spent two weeks looking into it. I actually was like, okay, yeah, NASA, secret space, <laughs> you know, they're all part of this. They're, they're satanic and all this different things that I did believe. So I went and looked at it. As it quickly came to the point of like, no, this, none of the science, you know, none of it works out. But it's that similar sort of thing. I think it's when you're told, oh, these people are lying to you, it becomes very attractive because mm -hmm. you don't want to be lied to. You just want you want to know what the truth is. And I think there is a massive overlap. I've, I see it like in a lot of the communities. If you're into one thing, you'll probably be into another mm -hmm. or you're going to get into another. And you can see it like even in like a majority anti-vax movement at the minute. And they were like pushing the, the ancient apocalypse stuff because so much of the mainstream was attacking it and saying it's the most dangerous series on Netflix. <laughs> like that just makes like conspiratorial people like attracted to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taboo. It's fringe. Oh, let's go look at it. If everyone in the mainstream is attacking it, it must be real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, you know, from my perspective, I think there's two reasons to sort of call out stuff like that. I'm not a fan of that headline in The Guardian, the most dangerous show on TV. That's just hyperbolic. But uh, I also had a somewhat hyperbolic headline, which was Graham Hancock declares war on archaeologists. But at the same time, I think that that's legit because he, he, he you know, from the first minute of the show, he's trashing us, right? He, he did come end. straight out the yeah. game swinging. He did. <laughs> and so it was just, it was, it was that. And so I, I, I think though there's, so that's the problem with, with, with the media, social media, the internet even is there's so many different audiences you want to reach. Right. I, 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 mm -hmm. and so, and, and they all get collapsed of course, because everything's available to everybody to a certain degree. Um, whether it's Twitter, YouTube, podcasts, or whatever, you know, I might be here speaking to, you know, the community that you have formed through your podcast, obviously, and I try to frame it, hopefully, in that way. But of course, there's going to be people from all kinds of backgrounds that are going to come and listen to it, right? Yeah. And so with that kind of article that I wrote, my half my goal was just to alert people that weren't believers in conspiracy theories that, hey, this is a conspiracy theory, right? And it has all the hallmarks of it. It wasn't necessarily written to convince people that were believing in it to stop believing in it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Or right, I, I gave a talk I mentioned to the University of Vienna. That's on YouTube right now. And that was addressed entirely to colleagues so that they understand the ways that pseudo-archaeology is used. But of course, 
that talk at this point has like 27,000 views, which clearly means it's beyond the community that I was addressing, right? right. And right. so that makes it difficult, of course, to to think through how to how to deal with this because whatever you say has the potential of being read or listened to or watched by people beyond who you're thinking that you're addressing it to, right? And you always, when you speak or write something, you want to have an audience in mind. That's important. How else do you make a point, right? Yeah. Um, that's compelling and backed up and whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, it makes it tough. Um, I think we need to speak out against it, but at the same time, I think we also need to think through effective ways. And I know people are working out. The other person who's responded, uh, uh, yes to the idea of debating Graham Hancock is David Miano, who has a very popular YouTube channel. Yeah, um, yeah. And so uh, he's he's very effective as well at, at public communication and communicating arche archaeological facts to the public and also to people that have, have followed conspiracy theories. Um, I think he just sent out a tweet about a message he got from somebody who's you know, a huge fan of Graham, came across the channel and then now has sold off all the books and believes in real archaeology. And, and I've had a little bit of success with that. I, I, I try less hard than he does to address that those communities simply because it takes up a lot of time, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it does. And, 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 and so, uh, yeah, it's a little harder. It's a little, it's a little more difficult. Um, and I have a lot of respect for David for doing that. Um, so, yeah, but that's why any and all, we all need to work to communicate. And it's, I, it's not good to know that this is so wrapped up in so much other conspiracism, but it highlights the importance of experts like me and of others who want to see who, who want to see real archaeology and history in, in the media and online and whatnot to, to recognize that because it shows the importance of paying attention to this. It's not something that exists in an isolated sort of way. And I've been doing more and more research with the growing popularity of things like it, Atlantis or advanced ice age civilizations and ancient aliens. There's these polls out of Chapman University of Americans only, but it shows the increase in belief, I think, for ice age, advanced ice age civilization. More than half Americans believe in that, right? Yeah. And, uh, and similarly, I've done some of my own research using sort of Google engrams, which shows how popular certain terms are are in written English text that Google has collected, right? And, you know, within the last 20, 30 years, we've seen Atlantis just skyrocket to the top. It is written about more often than Pompeii, you know, more often than Pericles. And so all this sort of legitimate archaeology and history, Atlantis is now far more popular in culture um than than any of those things i mean pompeii is damn popular right yeah. everybody's heard of pompeii yet yeah. everybody's talking about atlantis even more this place that, that plato made up right for philosophical allegory and so uh so yeah that's something i think we need to be paying attention to especially because of its connections to sort of more dangerous political rhetoric that that impacts you know people's lives um if this is leading to people um becoming in contact and more enamored with things like anti-vaxxer movements or more politically violent, dangerous conspiracist movements, then that's, that's a real problem. Right. And, uh, totally. it, show, it shows why we need to, to really make sure that we as experts communicate, but we also communicate to our bosses, why this is important and to politicians and to, you know, et cetera, to, to people mm -hmm. out there, to, to why this needs to get out there. Um, well, you have yeah. a good case study for the past like two and a half years from the pandemic to see yeah. how, um, you know, mm -hmm. science communicators did try to combat the anti-vax movement or the anti-lockdown movement and all that. You know, like, I guess you can go back and look at some of that to, you know, get an idea of how to communicate it better. Yeah, because you're under the same sort of at attack now. I, I can see such a similarity between the immunologists that I've been speaking to for two years to the kickback from specific. Um, fortunately, it's fortunately it's less fierce. Um, you yeah. know, I've been in the center of this because I got so many views from my thread and my article, and I had so many interviews, so I was in the news a lot. Um, so I've gotten, you know, I've gotten my fair share of uh, emails from people that were angry at me and. They tracked me down on social media, on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, and you know, and I've gotten my fair share, but it's nothing like the kind of vitriol that uh, 
that uh, I've seen people in from anti-vaxxers, thankfully, or from other more politically uh, charged uh, conspiracy movies. Yeah. And so that's that's something I'm th- I'm grateful for. And because if it was even more, I, I don't get paid enough. I don't have a secure enough job to <laughs> to put myself out there to 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 the point where I might need to move. Right? Uh, yeah. That that's not something I can afford to do. Um, if my life is in danger or something, I mean, obviously I would, but uh, but I, I can't really afford it. I would screw up my career. And uh, and so in that sense, I'm thankful that it's not quite the same thing. At, at the same level that this might be a introduction to people it's also therefore it's enough entertainment if you see what i mean Mm. that is less tied to people's and their thoughts about health and uh you know their own bodies and stuff like that or 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 politics and things like that this is not driving how people vote and uh it's not Mm. driving that kind of stuff in the same way it obviously can and does relate to people's identities because history and archaeology is very wrapped up in people's identities and and that's why there is a lot of emotion involved in some of the 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 comments directed my way but i've not had any real threats or anything like that thankfully i I hope after this i don't get any (laughs) but uh but uh, no, you I guess, know, I guess it is it is obviously different to like the anti-vax movement because I guess you know people in the anti-vax movement think that this stuff is killing people. Yeah, you know, and you disagreeing with Graham or pointing out where he's wrong isn't exactly killing people. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's totally different. The worst it is is I'm considered woke because I point out the overlap <laughs> between these conspiracy theories with white supremacism and racism, right? And now so, that was the next thing I wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that of is, course. Okay, because I've got a. I got to tie in with this myself. See, mm-hmm. I don't know Graham, but I am pretty certain the man is not a white supremacist. However, I also know myself and that mm-hmm. I am not an anti-Semite. Mm-hmm. However, with my conspiracism, I did push Illuminati conspiracy theories. And I did believe that the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers were part of the Illuminati. Mm-hmm. So if I pushed Rockefeller and Rothschild conspiracies, that's pushing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, exactly. even if that wasn't my intent. I but, mean, look, I, I have never met Graham. I have no idea how he treats other people. So I mm-hmm. am not saying I've never in anything I've said, said that he is a racist. But at the same time, we live in a world of racism and mm-hmm. it, it exists in multiple different ways. And so in that sense, everybody is guilty of being a racist, no matter what the background of your your color of your skin is or your ethnicity or whatever. We all participate in a society where racism has all kinds of unintended and intended impacts on marginalized groups. Right. And so in that sense, we're all racists. So if, if that's me calling Graham Hancock a racist, that's also me calling myself a racist, right? right? And so that's that's we all participate in this kind of society. And I personally believe we all should be interrogating what we do to try to minimize the unintended racism that we all commit. And so it's impossible to completely escape from society. That's that's completely impossible. But we should be interrogating the ways in which we participate in society and how that can have a knock-on effect on marginalized people that are out there, right? People of different races, genders, whatever. And so uh, I think I, I strongly believe that. And when you think about these kind of theories in particular, they are very much fodder for more overt racist people because the implication that people that are not white are not responsible for their cultural heritage is that they are therefore inferior to white people that were responsible for their own cultural heritage, right? And I have seen online actual explicit racists use these arguments, right? In fact, and so in that sense, I'm not saying that Graham Hancock necessarily even believes that all non-white people, it was all, I, I, I don't know what he believes, okay? Mm-hmm. But he does certainly state at multiple places in his book and on his website that he believes that some of the people from this advanced civilization were white. He specifically says that, particularly in indigenous America. He has several quotes in Fingerprints of the Gods. He has a few quotes in Magicians of the Gods, much more recently. And then he has several entries on his website that state this. And so... I, I don't know if he's changed his mind. He, he presents a different um, argument in his most recent book, Dealing with the Americas. Um, but 
So maybe he's changed his mind. But at the same time, I would hope that he would recognize that there are many, 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 many overt racists that use his arguments to argue for very, very clear white supremacism. Right. And I would hope that in the face of, of, of people like me and others that are critiquing this, I would hope he would take a moment to reflect and think about how some of his arguments might be used by overt white supremacists and racists, the ones that are, you know, really, really clearly and proudly racist. Um, and so I, I would hope that he would take a moment and try to work harder to make it so that his arguments don't feed into those types of people and those types of communities, right? right. Um, and so that's the argument I would make about uh, this. Uh, ancient aliens, too, is the same kind of thing because, again, it's the implication that non-white cultures were not responsible for their heritage. Instead, it's aliens that came, right? And so it's a, it's a problem with a lot of pseudo-archaeology is it ties into identity, and it oftentimes, through stripping the local cultural context, it changes which identities are responsible. And that, of course, is it has the implication that these more marginalized identities, these cultures are not responsible, and that's going to feed and reinforce sort of racism and white supremacism. And so... I mean, I don't know. I feel like this is an important thing to say. It's There's a lot of evidence that backs this up. I don't want this to be the only thing I talk about when I talk about pseudo-archaeology, and it's not. But it's a component of this form of conspiracy thinking, without a doubt. All right. Well, just one thing about it. Mm -hmm. Like, when he talks about the Mayan civilization and he talks about Quetzalcoatl, mm -hmm. he is leaning on the mythologies right of the people allegedly let me just say allegedly he's he's that's what he's telling us at least and that he said that they said these big tall white men with beards came and gave us this information mm -hmm. is that even true like are are the mayans then white supremacists or what what's going on here no it's not true at all <laughs> he, he uh, to graham's credit his books have footnotes Mm -hmm. Right. And he actually provides footnotes for quite a bit of those claims with regards to skin color. And if you go and you track him down, he never is able to find an indigenous source for his claim for what they say. What he finds are Spanish colonist sources in some cases. So it's colonists who write down these ideas. And of course, colonists, white people coming to the... Yeah. The, the Americas, mm, are they the most trustworthy people with regards to the myths of indigenous <laughs> people? I wouldn't think so. The other person who he loves, I mentioned Ignatius Donnelly as the one who founded this Atlantis as an antediluvian civilization. Yeah. He is one of the more frequent people that Graham Hancock cites for evidence, a source that mentions these people are white. This guy was writing in the 19th century, and there's a lot of racism in his book. Right. And so he is not a reliable source on the skin color or the beliefs of indigenous people, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And so uh, he has whole sections in his book, Ignatius Donnelly, that is about how there were white people that existed among the Native Americans with blue eyes and blonde hair showing that they, you know, like all this kind of bunk stuff. Right. And uh, so that's the problem. But what we do have is we have iconography, archaeological artifacts you know, that sh depict Quetzalcoatl. Mm -hmm. And is he white? No, not at all. That's not his skin color. So we actually have depictions from, you know, the past, from, from these traditional original cultures, right, that depict this stuff. And we know that these people were not white, or these, these, these figures, I should say. And so, it, it, yeah, that's, that's just bunk, and you can, tr you can go to his books, Look at the footnotes. First half of them go to Ignatius Donnelly. For some reason, he doesn't include many footnotes to Ignatius Donnelly. He should include more because he gets so many of his ideas directly from Ignatius Donnelly. If I was, if he was turning in an essay in one of my courses at the university level, I'd say, <laughs> you need to cite this guy more because it's clearly coming from there. But in the acknowledgement sections to Fingerprints to the God, he does say Ignatius Donnelly is the first person he mentions as one of his key 
sort of inspirations as somebody who was had his, I forget what the wording is, but who had their eyes open to the reality of the past and da 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 da. da. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, like the the eight or so times that he actually has a footnote to Ignatius Donnelly, most of them are about skin color, as evidence that the that there's a story or a myth that the indigenous people told about how they had white. I don't know, white strangers that came to them. And uh, that all comes filtered through colonial sources, if you see what I mean. There are no clear indigenous myths for this. And the archaeology we have that, that that's in full color does not support that either. I had a question, but I think like the way you've been speaking, I think you've pretty much answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> sure, right? go ahead. Graham and many others, including Eric Von Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin, they often lean into the mythologies to provide answers that they say the artifacts can't. Is that a legitimate line of inquiry? Do you look at the mythologies? And as you've been speaking, like, yeah, you seem to look at the mythologies as well for a bit of context. Yeah, we, we definitely look into the stories and mythologies that exist, any pieces of writing, etc. Oh, I don't know why a piece of writing would be more uh, – pieces of writing oftentimes are mythologies and they're oftentimes biased as well, right? Mm -hmm. Even even sort of histories. Um, and so histories are mythologies in a sense and mythologies are histories. And so, yeah, we use whatever evidence we can get. Um, we, there are pictures of the past. Like I, I you know, I, I firmly believe at this point by the 21st century, we have a pretty good picture of the past. We have yeah. millions of artifacts from all over the world. We have lots of different stories and, 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 and texts and things like that, different depictions and iconography and art. And so we have a pretty good picture of the past. We're not going to have something that will overthrow the paradigm of history. That's, that, that's ridiculous. Um, but we do need to understand the ways in which stories are told, right? And so stories communicate value. They are not told in a way that's necessarily always reflective of reality in the sense that you believe every detail within them. It doesn't mean that there's not kernels to investigate. We do that all the time, right? I study ancient Greece. So, you know, you could think about, you know, the term myth comes from things like the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? right. And for hundreds of years, we have fact-checked the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I can tell you, there's actually a lot to it that matches up reasonably well with archaeological evidence. And there's also a lot that does not. Right. And so in that sense, that's what we need to do. We need to take it and look at how those stories relate to the other evidence we have. That's what our job as scholars is. It isn't giving primacy of one evidence source over another, because at the same time, you can't go look at, I don't know, I study animal bones. You, you can in the right way. But most of the time, you can't look at animal bones and understand value, people's values in the past. On the other hand, yes. stories are fantastic at that. They're far better. And so we understand that different sources of evidence are used in different ways. And at the same time, we're always comparing them. So oral tradition is fantastic, right? And that's actually what sort of Homeric myth was. And there's been – and for a long time, look, look, scholars have taken ancient Greek myth and they've always given it a benefit of the doubt. They've treated it seriously and investigated how it connects to the archaeological evidence. And that's something that we need to do more of with indigenous stories. I do not deny that at all. Because, of course, archaeology has a very colonialist history as well, and a very racist history. And early archaeologists were very keen to argue that indigenous stories were just oral stories that have no grounding, while something like Homer, which was written down, of course, but based off of an oral tradition, that has more veracity to it. Total bullshit. They're both oral stories that need to be investigated closely and how they relate. And you can look at sort of the, the Greek mythology and how it relates to archaeology to get a sense of that, what you'd expect. There's, a, there's several real places in there, but there's also several not real places, right? At right. the same time, there's lots of – you can compare material culture. So in, in, in the story of behind the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, the Trojan War and whatnot, a lot of descriptions of sort of armor – and weaponry, right? That's right. coincidentally something that we excavate a whole lot of in the archaeological record. So it's perfect for comparing to mythology to the you know what we have evidence for material culture wise. So you, you know? would be able to say pinpoint down where there was a battle 
or something if you came across tons and tons of shields and lots of dead people. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps battles are sometimes tough to find. In fact, we don't even know if there was a big battle at Troy. We know right. that there's a there's a city there, but it's a huge, huge archaeological debate over whether there's evidence for a battle that could potentially be that kernel of truth for the Trojan War. And it's not very clear, to be honest, um, that. But what we do have is we have a lot of burials of people, and they're buried with weapons and armor, right? Uh, right. And so, and then at the same time, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, we have a lot of clear visual descriptions of weapons and armor. So a really famous one that everybody always brings up is many times in Homer, he describes a helmets made out of the tusks of boar. Right. We have those. We have very, very phenomenally several boar's tusks helmets. They all date to the Bronze Age, right? They don't show up in burials that are later in the Iron Age. Homer, if he if he was a real person, that's another big debate. But the first evidence that the sort of these these oral stories were written down, it would have happened at the later part of the Iron Age, so like 800 BC ish, 700 BC ish, right? Mm -hmm. um, while the Bronze Age ends, you know, like 1200 or 1100 BC ish. So those boar's tusk helmets, they show up in graves from sort of 1600 down to like 1100 BC, right? And, uh, and, and, and this is written down, the earliest it could be written down, it's like 800 BC. So there's something there, there's that kernel of truth there, right? That shows up. We can also do this with the shields and the spears. And in particular, what's great about that is we, we don't just sometimes get those in graves. We also have painted pottery or frescoes that depict armed soldiers with shields and spears. And what's really cool is when you start looking at all these different forms of shields and spears and the way they're described in this Homeric epic, it correlates to shields and spears that some of which existed in the Bronze Age and some of which existed in the Iron Age. It's all mismatched together within this piece of oral poetry because the oral poetry adapted over time and certain bits were held on from hundreds of years earlier. Others were transformed into a different bit of poetry that was invented in one storytelling that ended up getting captured and written down. And so sometimes we even get it in the same scene where we'll have a spear that's in one character's hand and it, it's described in its description. It's like a Bronze Age spear. The very next line, it's description, it's an Iron Age spear. And so, <laughs> so for a while, scholars thought we could have a stratigraphy of this sort of mythology. We could say, oh, maybe this section was composed or not written down, but, but sort of composed during the Bronze Age and this section during the Iron Age. Now we know that it's a lot more fluid than that, right? What was written down, it captures bits and pieces that were added on a line here, a line there. They all meet a poetic meter. Right. Just like a song. And mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, it's all this mishmash of stuff. And we have this mishmash of kind of Bronze Age and Iron Age stuff. And since the versions we have were written down even later, we have adaptations and edits that even come later than 800, 700 B.C. Um, there's this thing called the Pisistratid recension when in Athens in sort of like about a little before 500 BC, it seems like it was more canonically made more orthodox. And then a few hundred years later in the Hellenistic period, it's made even more orthodox by these scholars then. And so there's sort of changes that we can attribute to it, the, to those periods as well, sort of additions and edits and things like that. And we know there's a lot of different versions that were floating around in the kind of oral storytelling world that existed at that time. Um, and we can see that sometimes through fragments that we get that are not in that canonical version, or we get these scholars that have this kind of written version and they write little notes in the margin. I've also heard it told in this way, like this line, that version mm -hmm, of that right. line, or you get art. So we have all this sort of painted pots that show mythology, right? Mythic scenes, Achilles, the Trojan War, the, the gods and the heroes, all that kind of stuff. And we sometimes get artistic scenes that we don't have textual evidence for. And we get it repeated all the time. So there's this one that's really famous. It's on dozens of pots, on these painted pots. It's Achilles and Ajax playing a board game on the beach right outside Troy, right? It's right. this perfect scene of kind of soldiers killing time. There must be some story behind it because we get it on 
I don't know how many pots, at least a dozen, maybe more. And they're all in a bunch of really famous museums and stuff like that. And uh, they're all complete because they came from graves. And, you know, so they're, they're, they're in great high resolution. So we know that this was some sort of story. We have no idea what that story was. So it's we not have, like you, you haven't – it's not written down anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a way that was preserved for us because, you know, yeah. And so it's also why, for example, we know that Atlantis was not even a myth that was told in a sort of oral storytelling tradition because the first and really only appearance of it is in Plato's dialogue, the Critias and the Timaeus. We have not a single piece of art because we have far more art than we have textual sources because we have thousands of, of depictions of different myths, right? And so we don't have a single bit. There's no vocabulary out there in any of our textual artistic traditions, which at this point is pretty damn rich, that would correspond to this being some sort of oral tradition. We know of many different stories that Plato invented, and this is one of them, just like the cave, you know? It's yeah. not a story that, that was told by other people, something only that comes from Plato, and later later sources in the Roman in the Greek and Roman period after Plato refer to it as Plato telling us about this, right? So they even thought of it only through Plato. So, you know, it's 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 just not it's not a myth. It's not an oral story, that Atlantis sort of story, right? Yeah. Excellent. So we do take them seriously is the point. And where there's mm -hmm. a lot of study into this topic in all the different cultures of the world. Yeah. So you do look at the mythologies. Mm -hmm. You do look at the astronomical stuff. You do look under the water. You <laughs> seem to do all the things that Graham has just said that you don't do. Yeah. And that's why it's frustrating to hear these kind of accusations. And, he yeah, knows yeah. this is this is where this is where I, I have to interpret that at least this part of what he's saying is totally in bad faith, you know, because yeah. he reads archaeology. He cites archaeology throughout his books. A lot of it's out of date, but not all of it. And he reads it and cherry picks it. I don't know if he reads it all. Maybe he has someone he hires to read it and get him stuff that fits. I, I don't know. He's wealthy enough, maybe. I think but, between him, between Robert Bruval and John Anthony West and Robert Schock, they should have, like, one of them should know it. Yeah, no, they know it. I, but that's what they do. They, they, they stigmatize the conversation by saying that we ignore them, we ignore the stuff, when we definitely don't. Archaeologists want to invest. I mean, one of my favorite sayings that I say to students, to, to the public, is that really – any branch of human knowledge can come in handy for archaeology. It could Amazing. be computers. It could be chemistry. It could be geology. It could be physics. It could be astronomy. It could be literature. It could be comparative literature. It could be languages. It could be philosophy. It could be any branch of human knowledge you think of that relates to archaeology, and there are archaeologists that consider it. So There's you're not just digging in the dirt. No, <laughs> we all have our various specializations, of course, but yeah. we embrace all of those interdisciplinary crossovers. It's actually one of the critiques we get. There's no real archaeological paradigms, if you will. All of, all of what we do <laughs> is we, we borrow from other disciplines the idea of stratigraphy in the soil to understand architecture and the, the deposits of finds and things like that. That comes from geology. You know, yeah. understanding sort of the way that societies interact with their artifacts and stuff that comes from history and sociology and anthropology. You know, yeah. all, everything that archaeologists sort of the, the methods we use. I study animal remains. I use all kinds. I use organic chemistry and I use anatomy, uh, biology and stuff like that and ecology to, to, to make my arguments. Right. And so uh, everything that archaeologists do draws upon a different branch of human knowledge. And they're all welcome within the field, right? There's, there, there's, there's some archaeologists that's working with, and many usually, with any field out there and every field out there, be it economics to whatever, computers to, you know, statistics to, you know, that all these things are used by us. And so, yeah, whatever your, your field is, <laughs> you could apply that to archaeology. But I do recommend doing it with an archaeologist because what we do bring to bear is that context. Right. Yeah. We're familiar with what's local where you get an Egyptologist. They can show you all the different sites 
that show you the development of the abilities to build the pyramids. They can show you the iconography. They can show you where the people who built the pyramids, the village they lived in, and they can build that local context. And that's why you need to work with an archaeologist because that's that's what we really provide is that kind of context, right? Yeah, context as yeah. to like why this actually fits here. Yeah. Like this is a thing I found like – very important to do in my some dare call it conspiracy podcast is to show the historical context show the timeline because a lot of the times these conspiracies are presented out of context the the timeline isn't right like you were saying earlier about i shouldn't be comparing serpent mound to giza like there's a completely cultural context that's just different like these are two different groups of people on a completely different side of the earth at completely different times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. completely different times now you, <laughs> you keep foreshadowing some things that i want to say right because <laughs> <laughs> you just brought up paradigm and this is the last thing that i wanted to bring up with you okay um right what do you think of this quote from Graham. Now, I want to ask you because this type of quote is what really speaks to conspiracists. Mm -hmm. The quote is, changing a paradigm is no easy business. When a particular mindset has become the preoccupation of a group of scholars in a particular field, they are so reluctant to let go of it. They become existentially attached to it, and an attack on the paradigm becomes an attack on them. And so they vigorously defend it. What's your thoughts on this statement? <laughs> I mean, my my big thought is is that accusing archaeology of paradigms is a big pill to swallow. There are even accredited archaeologists that agree with Graham Hancock. Robert Schock teaches at Boston University, right? So right. there's a archaeology is a big tent. And uh, includes a wide, wide, wide range of opinions and a wide range of disagreements. And so in that sense, there's not some sort of orthodoxy that says you're only allowed to say one thing. If you can get something, there's a lot of peer-reviewed publications by conspiracists, people who I would consider conspiracists, the Comet Research Group that Graham Hancock uh, collaborates with, they have some peer-reviewed publications do I, if I was a peer reviewer, I do not think I would have agreed to pass that because I think it's crap, but they found a peer reviewer who did because there is no pure orthodoxy. What to get a, a something through peer review, you just need two reviewers to sign off and say that it's acceptable, right? right. And since everybody has different opinions on things, all kinds of stuff are published and taught and whatnot by people who disagree with each other. And so that's one of my big problems because mm -hmm. I, I also disagree strongly with several of my colleagues uh, who I think are very intelligent, um, good archaeologists and good scholars. But on very specific aspects of ancient Greek culture, I disagree with them strongly, right? right. And uh, including people that taught me, right? My, my supervisors on my PhD, I disagree with them on things. And I was able to get that into my PhD. That's also something as a peer reviewer. You don't have to agree with everything in an article, right, to, to, mm -hmm. to say that it goes through peer review. You could disagree with certain components, and you would phrase your disagreements in a peer review, and then they would try to address it, and they would have to convince the editor that they did a worthy enough job of addressing them. They don't need to change their opinions, though, to agree with everything the peer reviewer said, right? And so archaeology, in that sense, is a big tent, um, there, it's also filled with people with a lot of different personalities, right? Some people will have a personality that if you disagree with me, that's a personal attack on me. So there are people that are like that because archaeologists are humans, right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. so like uh, they have emotions, they have thoughts, they have whatever, they have turfs they want to protect. That is human nature. Mm -hmm. And so obviously some of that is true as well. At the same time, archaeology, like all sciences, is changing and adapting uh, its picture of what it studies, right? Um, it, we, our paradigms, if you will, are constantly changing. Uh, 20 years ago, nobody would publish, because there's no evidence for it, that Neanderthals and, modern, and, and anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, made it, right? And had children together. Now we know they did from the ancient genetic evidence, right? Because we have new methods 
to investigate old finds. We also yeah. have plentiful new finds, right? I took place in the excavation in Greece of the excavation of the Griffin Warrior tomb. It was a shaft grave at right outside the Palace of Nestor at Pylos, so Bronze Age, you know, it's a Palace of Nestor is described in Homeric epic. It looks nothing like like what Homer described it as, but that's besides <laughs> the point. Um, but it's described there, and, and, and yeah, we found this grave, and it really helped revolutionize our understanding of sort of connections between Crete and the mainland at that time because we have this new evidence that we have discovered um, based off traditional methods in that case, so they're also doing more... Uh, advanced methods to study the finds. Um, but uh, so, so yeah, so we are constantly finding new stuff, asking new questions, and using new methods that are updating our picture of the past. And so we're always changing our paradigms. I mean, to be honest, I think that every single paper that's published updates our understanding of the past. Why would we be publishing something unless we had something new to say? There's no point in publishing in a scientific journal unless you have something new, right? Whether it's a new piece of evidence that adds to the picture or whether it's a new piece of evidence that changes the picture or whether it's a new method or whatever, that's why we publish in scientific journals. When we publish for a public audience, we try to summarize sort of our understanding, our personal understanding oftentimes of the field. But, uh, but when we publish in scientific journals, all the thousands and millions of articles and books that are published every single one of them is changing the paradigm right yeah and that's science so, isn't it science yeah. is continually shifting and continually changing the more data and information that comes in yeah well yeah it's supposed to always be hypothesis testing to a yeah. degree and, and and some of it's inductive and some of it's deductive obviously it depends on what you're doing you mm -hmm. know you might be choosing to dig in this area to test a hypothesis about what you're going to find but then you're going to find additional stuff that you're learning about inductively through which you also develop new hypotheses to test deductively that's how archaeology works right and yeah. so and that's how our grant proposals work you can't get a permit or funding to excavate in a, a field unless you've put together a proposal to the funding body, to the permitting body, et cetera, all these different bodies that shows you have a hypothesis you want to test. Same thing with studying material. You can't just go ahead and study material. Nobody gets to. You don't get to just go out and study stuff. You have to really rigorously document why you want to study it, what methods you're using. They all need to be checked up upon by legal authorities and the funding bodies to be able to do it. Yeah. It's very similar to most other conspiracies, essentially, that they create a boogeyman that is somehow a monolith. Yeah. Like the BBC is a monolith or the and mainstream media is like this monolith. And, and the thing I've come to realize is that none of that is true. Yeah. Like, obviously, there's... It's a body made up of a load of different people. And I can see that. I can see that now, like having a little bit of a glimpse inside of the media. Like I've met so many reporters over the past two years. I've spoken to journalists and I can see, like, I don't want to say stupid, but how naive that belief is that like, like these things can be monoliths. Like archaeology just moves as one mm -hmm. or... I mean, true. look... I am 100% sure that there's no, not only, sorry, no evidence, but that it's actually disprovable, this idea of an Ice Age advanced global civilization with megaliths and agriculture. That mm -hmm. said, if I could prove even just one component of that hypothesis is true, I would have a top paper, I would have grant funding to pursue it in the future, I would have pretty much guaranteed employment based off that grant funding. I don't grant funding, by the way, is not like money I can spend for like a house and a car and stuff like that. It's only money for scientific research. But yeah. if I could even prove one component of that hypothesis is true, I would be wanting to publish it a in the right way first, but then as soon as I could in the right way, because it would make my career. Right. Yeah. So there's yeah. no justification for somebody like me, an early career researcher who wants to find a tenure track job, to participate in hiding the truth from people, right? If yeah. anything, I would be making a living off of showing that truth, and if it was actually true. <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so it's it's it, this idea that I'm paid by big archaeology or I something <laughs> like that is like it just 
belies belief because I don't know. I've been in the field long enough that I know how it works, but it also is just, yeah, it's again, that kind of rhetoric that works. And I think it behooves all of us, you and, and, and me and everyone else interested in pseudo-archaeology and conspiracy theories to also recognize that uh, the conspiracy community is not a monolith either. Um, no. And people who follow pseudo-archaeology, it's not a monolith either. As mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, it's obviously very different from more politically charged conspiracy thinking, where uh, to many people it's entertainment. And so it's therefore it's going to have a different kind of appeal and a different type of group and in it within it there's all sorts of different groups and so it behooves all of us to recognize just how complex human societies and cultures are i mean that's something i hope archaeology can help people appreciate it's one of the reasons why something like ancient aliens or a, an advanced ice age civilization kind of annoys me personally not just as an archaeologist but because part of what i want to share with the world is just how complex and nuanced humans are you know, and just yeah. how smart we are as well. Right. And yeah. so like we were in all the past and I hope that people that look at history and archeology, span they get a sense of the richness of human, of humanity from it, you know, and uh, sort of moving away from that diversity and complexity and nuance of the past towards just one solution. It makes it less nuanced. It makes it less, it makes it more monolithic and mm -hmm. uh, all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's, what's annoying. Right. <laughs> I did say that was the last question, but I do have one more. All right, one more, but then I do <laughs> got to go. Said it, and then we got to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a quick one. Don't worry. Okay. It's, it's a quick no, one. No, you're fine. <laughs> so, are you saying we're not a species with amnesia? <laughs> you know, I don't even understand that phrase at all because it makes no sense with his argument. In the sense that, like, like he's arguing that that there's this <laughs> recollections of the past from these stories that he is translating for us that actually remember some sort of flood cataclysm, and it's the archaeology which is not based off of any remembrance but based off of physical evidence that seems to have forgotten it. So nothing about that really makes sense to me as a logical phrase other than it sounds cool. Because um, it doesn't fit his, his argument to me, uh, at least the way I read his art. Maybe, Graham, if you're listening, explain it, because I don't understand how that even fits his argument at all, because his argument is people remembered these floods and stuff like that. Uh, but are we a species with amnesia? I think amnesia, it doesn't fit well. I think we're a species that that tells stories that fits our own context of our own period of time. So in that sense, we're never going to capture the past perfectly. And that's true even of archaeology and history as practiced. And that's a good thing because there's so much going on in the past. You mentioned how archaeologists and historians can be boring. Well, we should work on telling stories about the past that are based in facts that are relevant and interesting because that's what archaeology and history exists to do. It exists to help people understand and think about humanity as a whole, to think about their specific identities, to think about what happened in the past and how that can relate to decisions we make today. Um, I really hate the old story history repeats itself or we don't want to make sure we want to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. That's bollocks. It doesn't repeat itself. It's totally silly. But at the same time, everything we do in today's world is based off of history. Anyway, um, you could think about economics, how we look at the stock market. That's all based off of historical, you know, what, what happened. You could think about uh, oh, science is based off of history experiments. What happened? That's history, of course, what happened in an experiment. And so therefore we assume that it will happen again, right? Every yeah. single branch of knowledge is based off of what happened in the past. And so we use the past to inform what we do in our day-to-day -day lives and as uh, political culture and, uh, you know, et cetera. And so I think in that sense, history is very valuable. Um, and archaeology is very valuable to understand and make decisions and know who we are and how we fit into the world. So we should be telling stories that are relevant and that that matters. And, and so we, we need to work to do that um, rather than just thinking that uh, 
the way history was told 100 years ago is the right way of telling history because they were telling history for their times as well. And history is always being rewritten. And that's what our job is. So, yeah, that's what we're supposed to be doing based off of new evidence, new questions, and a new world situation that we exist in today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Flint Dibble. Thank you, Brent. It was a pleasure. <laughs>